No worries. God bless you, brother. Good to see you. God bless you. How are you? Good to see you. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Really, Eli, if you don't mind collecting the Sunday school. Oh, no. Now, before we get started, there's a piece of paper on the communion table on the back. This week, we're going to do a review on what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse. This is the opportunity for you to ask any questions, uh, anything that's been going through your mind during the study, or even anything that happened in your mind this morning. This is the time to ask it when it comes to what we've been going over. The piece of paper in the back is for next week when we start our study on the book of Psalms. Now, I'll collect these at the end of Sunday school. I'll have something in the back offering plate to collect them. But what it is, is if there's anything that you want to study in the book of Psalms, whether it's a particular psalm, whether it's some particular words that you may not know or be familiar with, that is the paper to write them on. And then that gives me an idea on how to help me to prepare to study because I know, of course, I have a general idea of where I want to go, where God wants me to go. But it doesn't mean that we can't make a quick side detour or something or throw it out there because we will be looking at the book of Psalms. Now, we've been looking at, before I do that, does everybody have a piece of paper? Did you want one from the judge? I'm just going to the book. Okay, that's fine. So, what we've been teaching on is what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse? And we like it to the individual who goes to the gym and constantly gets lean and, and gets lean and mean, buff and tough. And that does not happen overnight. You can't look at a piece of gym equipment and all of a sudden those muscles appear out of nowhere. And you can't go for one day and expect great results. Say, oh, I've done my half an hour or whatever time, now I don't need to go again. But rather, the person who gets muscles upon muscles that we get envious of or jealous of, it takes consistent effort for that individual. They go to the gym maybe five or six times a week. They're there for maybe about 45 minutes to an hour, depending, you know, and they're consistent in what they do. They have a leg day, a back day, uh, an arm day, and so forth and so forth. And they focus on those groups. And that's how they get me in um, buff and tough. Because they're intentional about it. And they don't do it just one time, and that's it. They're consistent. The same thing is true with us as Pentecostal powerhouses or just Christians. If we are going to become mighty in spiritual things, it's not going to happen when we come to church one time a week or when we open our Bible for one time. Or maybe we read our Bible every single day. And not that there's not power in the Word, but if we do not do it with the intent that I may know Christ, it's not taken near the root that it's supposed to. We might have it temporarily in our minds and get a mind knowledge, but it never takes root in our heart. The same way with prayer. There are people that can take off praying in tongues and sound, all kinds of spiritual. But really, the prayer only goes to the ceiling because it's superficial. They're not really even, they're not involved in the prayer to begin with. They're just talking. And the Bible refers to that as vain babblings. Now, we can talk and talk and talk to God and pray and pray and pray. Oh God, do this. Oh God, do this. But if there's no intent behind it or no real uh, persistence behind it or meaning, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just vain battle. But we begin by talking about faith. <coughs> and really, when we look at the church world, there's a lot of things that are lacking. And part of it is due to faith. The Bible says that signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. Well, why don't we have signs? Why don't we have wonders following us anymore? What's happened? Well, part of it is people lack faith. And when people lack faith, what's the enemy of faith? Doubt. I believe more towards doubt because fear leads to doubt. And when people doubt, what happens when you have doubt? You can't have faith. 
Doubt is the enemy of faith. Because when we look at it, where do we go to find the biblical definition of faith? Do you remember? I know this is going way, 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 way back. Or can you quote the biblical definition of faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If we break down that verse, we have faith and hope connected. And faith, faith. Exactly. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But faith is the substance of hope. And we can actually translate it as um, faith is the confidence of hope. The evidence of things not seen. Sorry, I didn't replay it in my mind because it's been a while since I've got over that formula. But when we look at those two, faith and hope go together. Never doubt, because doubt is the enemy of faith, and therefore it is the enemy of hope. If you hope, you don't have doubt. You know it's going to happen. And when we talk about hope in the Bible, it is a confidence. It's not like when I go home, I hope that there's a chocolate Oreo cake in the fridge, even though my wife never made it. No, but it's a, it's a definition. We can hope for something. We can want for something. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be there. Hope is a confidence, a knowing. I know that when I open up my hymnal today, I have confidence that when I hope to open up the songbook to find that page number that my brother Dennis or Sister Holly tells us to go to, that is going to be there if somebody did not rip it out. No, it's a confidence. It's something that we can go forward without, with a reassurance. Then we talk about prayer. Because if we're going to become a Pentecostal powerhouse, we need faith. But if we never pray, we're not going to have faith. And we're not talking about one of these lay me down to pray sleeps. And if we all are honest, we've all prayed those more of the times than we should have meant to because God bless us, we bless our bodies, amen, because we're in such a hurry to eat. We don't really process it. I mean, really the reason as Christians that we pray over our food is if there's anything bad in it to our bodies, God's going to take care of us. That's where it all originated from. Not that God blesses some chocolate cookie and may it turn into a nutritious care. That's what's going down in prayer. But God, if there's anything there, take care of it. And when we're going to build our faith, it all comes back to prayer. And we're talking about earnest prayer, where we are intentionally praying, that we are aware of it. It's not something that we're just doing as a byproduct because we need to pray every single day. We need to pray more than one time a day, so we pray and we go through the motions. It's an intentional communication process with God. Because as someone once said, prayer is not a monologue, it is a dialogue. It is us talking to God, but it's us all it is also us being in a place where we wait and we listen for God to speak to us as well. And it's a ready process because God doesn't always give us our answer during prayer. There are times He may give it to us when we're waking up, as we're walking across the room. There have been plenty of times that God has talked to me when I'm off getting ready to do something else, brother in law. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost is there and He begins speaking. So prayer is an intentional communication with God. And along with prayer, if we're going to really become an apostle powerhouse, what else should prayer be coupled with? Confession. With what? Confession. Confession's good. I'm not, it's just not the... This is the problem with but the teacher, when they're trying to look for a direct answer. But confession is good because we need to make sure that our hearts are right in prayer. But when it comes with prayer, it should be coupled with fasting. If we're really going to get serious with God, it's going to come when we're fasting. Because if we are praying, we should have already confessed our sins, made sure that there's nothing in our life. If there's any faults in our life, if we have any unforgiveness, that's the time we need to get it right is in prayer. That is the time 
when we are communicating with God, but it's also the time when we're allowing God to communicate with us. Not only gives answers on God, why, why there's so much sin in the church, or what vital signs and wonders follow with us, but also, you realize now is the time for us to allow God to judge us, that if there's anything in my life, reveal it now, that way I'm not embarrassed when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now is the time to get it right. Not only that, but that I may change my ways and live holier and closer to God. That I may hear your voice like never before. Because part of the reason that people don't hear the voice of God is because they're not living a holy life. Their spiritual ears and their spiritual eyes are so blinded and deafened because they're allowing so many things in the world to creep in that they can't see or hear God. But when we fast, we are showing God that, God, I need to see you move like that before. It is a commitment. Do not make a commitment to God and break it. If you tell God that you're going to fast on such a day or fast such a meal, do not break it because it's better not to make a vow than to make a vow and break it. So don't ever tell God anything that you don't intend on keeping. But when we look at fasting, it shows that we need to push away the old man that we need to sacrifice because this old flesh likes to rise up and say, I'm hungry, feed me now, even though it's not going to die for several weeks if you don't feed it, but it wants food and it wants food now. Fasting shows our commitment, our sacrifice to God that we are going to push away the old man, that we are going to do whatever it takes to get him to him, no matter the cost. We are going to sacrifice that we may know him in the power of his resurrection. And fasting is a lost heart in the church world today. If we go back to the time of John Wesley, <coughs> he fasted two times a week. Every week. And they didn't have to get up, and the pastor didn't have to get up and say, Church, we're going to fast on this day this week. They didn't have to do that, because they knew, according to the tradition that set forth by the apostles, every Wednesday, Every Friday, we're fasting. You didn't have to tell them that. It's just like getting out of bed and having to tell your brother, he says, did you brush your teeth this morning? It was such a regular occurrence that it didn't need to be said. But we are living in a world today where fasting is a lost art. We're living in a church world today where prayer is a lost art, much less fasting. And when people do know how to pray, we've lost the art of intercessory prayer for the most part. Because when was the last time we've seen people uh, in church when the Holy Ghost was dealing with an individual to get right, that we actually saw other Christians back there begging and pleading God, the Holy Ghost, for their soul. We've lost the art of intercession. So moving on from there, because we've got 56 pages of notes, and I think we're only about page 10. But... Moving on from there, we talked about the armor of God. And we likened it to Saul's armor when he gave to David. Now there was a problem with Saul's armor upon David. And do you know what that problem was? It's too big. It wasn't made for David, was it? It was too big. It was clumsy. It didn't hang right. And when the armor was too big, maybe it left an awful wide gap in the shoulder for the protection where the sword could have entered versus where it should have been tighter on the individual. The armor of God is not like Saul's armor. Saul's armor was fleshly. It was carnal. It was man-made. It was designed for a specific individual and that individual only. God's armor is spiritual. It is not carnal. It is not fleshly. But it is powerful to the pulling down of strongholds, and it is designed for each one of us. And it is designed for each one of us in our situation. For example, we have a shield of faith. If mom has a lot more faith than I do, you realize that her shield is a lot larger than mine, is a lot more powerful, because I've allowed my armor to be weak, because I have not been maintaining it. I have not been building it up. Because how do we increase our faith? Does anybody know how the Bible states that faith cometh? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our 
armor is specifically designed for us. The sword of the spirit, our um, sandals of peace, all of our armor is designed for us. It's not Saul's armor. It's God's armor. However, it's up to us to determine the strength of our armor, to have, determine how effective it is, because it's all dependent upon us. If our faith is weak, don't effect, expect a strong shield. It's all built upon us. Now, the very first weapon that's mentioned, does anybody know what the first weapon mentioned is? Or the first piece of armor? Not the word of God, brother, but rather it's something that keeps your pants up. It is the belt of truth. And when we look at that, that is the very first piece of armor that's mentioned. And it, rightly so it is the first piece of armor mentioned. Because when it comes to medieval armor and all those back there during that time, and even the writing of the Bible... The belt is what held the entire armor together. It's what kept the breastplate snug. It's what kept all the chain armor together. Whatever they used, it's what kept it secure and snug and where it's supposed to be. And the Bible tells us that our belt, the thing that holds our entire armor together, our entire suit, is true. And when you look at the church world today, how much truth is really in the church world today? We have too many ministers, preachers who have known better or have begun deceiving or been deceived, believing a lie, even though they knew much better a long, long time ago. Me and Brother Eli had this conversation this morning. They are deceived. They push humanism, man over God, instead of God over man. If it feels good, just do it. It's not about you. It's not about God, it's about you. What makes you feel good, as long as you're happy, that makes God feel happy. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's deception, that's what they're pushing off as truth. Or, in order to win the world, if we're going to get these teenagers, Sister Jane, we need to have dances in our church too. Something to draw them in. They're using worldly tactics to try and win the laws. That is not truth. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And because of that, we fool ourselves. That's because we need to make sure that our armor is being held together by the truth. And what does the Bible say is the truth? Somebody said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the life. Jesus Christ is the truth. Our armor needs to be held together by the truth of Jesus Christ and by the truth of his word. Because we know that the word is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the living word. And moving on, because I'm running out of time, because I don't know how far I am in my notes, but I don't think I'm that far. Nope, we're only about page 20 at this point. <coughs> but we talked about the other pieces of the armor. How much of the armor did God tell us to put on? The whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. So don't take just the shield, don't take just the breastplate, don't take just the boots, but take on the whole armor of God. Why? Because the armor, if we look at physical armor, it is designed to protect the human body, more specifically, the vital organs. The breastplate was covered, it had two pieces, front and back. It was designed to protect the major organs, the heart, the lung, and the kidneys. When we look at the sandals of serenity or the sandals of peace, whatever you want to call them, they weren't actually just Nike sneakers. They were shoes that had hobnails or spikes put into the bottom of it, like more like cleats. That way when the enemy came to push against you, you could stand your ground. The armor of God is very specific and it's designed to stand every attack of the enemy. In fact, just like the shield is designed to quench the fire, all the fiery darts of the UAD, the armor is designed to protect us against any attack of the enemy. And when it seems like you're standing your ground and you can take no more and the enemy's pushing against us, we have an adversary, not an adversary, but we have
have an advocate who will come rushing to our side. When it seems like we can take no more, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost will come in, like, I just, I'm just paraphrasing at this point, but he will come in in a mighty, mighty way, and he will raise up a barrier against the enemy and help us fight and fight for us. Now we've talked about, and of course there's the helmet of salvation, which protects our mind. Now going forward, after we talked about the armor, we started to get a little bit more in depth. Because when we're talking about things like the armor of God, there's something that should have already taken place in our life. And that is salvation. Because if we have not confessed our sins and turned from our wicked ways, we are not a child of the king. We are still living in sin. But if we confess our sins, turn from our wicked ways, and accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we are ready to start prepping to put on the armor of God. We're all ready to put on the armor of God and let it grow with us. But even more importantly than that, along with that, we are ready for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When we look at salvation, salvation is for who? Everyone. It is for everyone. And what about the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Who is the baptism of the Holy Ghost for? I was going to say, let me add one more clause on that. Everyone who believes. So salvation is meant for everyone. Some man came to seek and save that which is lost. When an individual accepts Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, right then and there, they are a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is a free gift to everyone who believes. And the thing is, we are living in a church world today where sadly, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is getting more and more lost. Less and less people are seeking for it. It used to be that you could go across the country and probably see multiple people that, who claim to be Christian that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But nowadays, it's hard to find people that claim to be Christians that are really Christians to begin with. We are living in the day and age where there's a great falling away. And it's sad if we go back through history because you realize that they used to release doves in the old churches symbolizing the, fall, the coming of the Holy Ghost um, on the day of Pentecost, but yet very few people had the baptism back then. And we are living in a day and age where bat the gifts of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, is slowly becoming a lost gift in the churches. And now when we say the baptism of the Holy Ghost, of course we mean the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I want to throw this out here. Um, well, Quick second, holding off on that thought. The purpose of the baptism is to empower believers to be witnesses, to perform the calling of God in their life, cast out devils, lay hands on the sick, see them recover, to edify the church, and to help us to pray for things that we know not. Now, when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we need to make sure that we do not get ourselves in a rut and think that you have to be a certain age to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Anyone who receives the salvation, and as we define salvation, confessing the sins, turning from wicked ways, serving God, accepting Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, they are a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Which means, if little Josiah gives his heart to Jesus, that he is already a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You realize that as human beings, we can put stigmas on certain things and not think of them in a proper way. Because in the Holy Ghost, there is no such thing as a Holy Ghost deacon, Holy Ghost pastor, Holy Ghost mother, Holy Ghost father, Holy Ghost child. They're all Holy Ghost built people in the eyes of God. Which means that if little Josiah gets filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we come and he starts giving prophecy, he starts giving tongues, that is nobody's place to say, well, he's too young, he should not be doing. Not that I've ever heard this saying that, ever heard that said in this church, but just throwing it out there while we're on the topic. 
There is no such thing as specific age Holy Ghost people or that they should not be used in this manner until they are a certain age. The Holy Ghost is for everyone that believes and he gives to everyone gifts severally as he wills. Not as he wills or I wills, but as he wills, regardless of age. And when we talk about the purpose of tongues in the new, in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we see back at that is a, something that is restored uh, to the church, just like all the gifts were. They are restoring to the church something that was lost way back when. Back at Babel, God confused language to scatter the people because they wanted to stay together through disobedience. God said, no, you're going to go away, and he did it through tongues. When it comes to church, he used tongues to unify the church and bring everyone together. We talked about the gifts of the Spirit, how there are revelation gifts, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discernment of spirits. We know that there are power gifts, the gifts of faith, the gifts of healing, uh, working of miracles. And there are inspiration gifts, the gifts of prophecy, gifts of tongues, and gifts of interpretation. The gift of tongues and interpretation seems to be a gift that goes hand in hand. And the only real difference between prophecy, tongues, and interpretation in the first, the interpretation of tongues, and tongues in general, is it seems to be, it takes just a little bit more faith to be used in the gifts of tongues and prophecy versus the, the gift of interpretation of tongues versus the gift of tongues. Does that mean that we need a window of the person who's only used in tongues? Absolutely not. Because all gifts are perfect. They are all given by God. Tongues is for the unbeliever, whereas the interpretation of tongues is for the church. We talk about the person who's used in tongues, if there's no interpretation, that the person who's used in tongues edifies himself. When the, edit, when the interpretation comes forth, then it edifies the body, because then everybody else knows what he's talking about, or she knows, or what she's talking about. But God states in his word that the gift of tongues is for the unbeliever. And of course, those are the three um, gifts that we have going forth in our churches, right? That we are evident of. There are maybe other gifts that we are not aware of. But at the same time, once again, it comes to the fact that Less and less people, unfortunately, are seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need to get back to a church that knows what it is to seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and to help others seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because when it comes down to it, we talked about the gifts of the Spirit and how everybody that we get down to studying the gifts of the Spirit, they are recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 all the way to 14. There is not a pause and a break to talk about how much we need to love each other in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. But rather, Paul is giving instruction of the church that basically, Brother Eli, I don't care if you're used in tongues. If you don't do it out of love, it's worthless. Or I don't care if you prophesy, but if you do it without love for your fellow brother or sister, you're nothing more than a sounding brass or a tinkling. Symbol. That's all Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 13, that if we are not used in the gift out of love and have love in our heart, we're just making a bunch of noise. That's all we're doing. Not that it may not be beneficial for somebody, but there are plenty of church people that have been used in the gifts of the Spirit that have walked the gifts of the Spirit, that have used them out of their own spirit. And because of that, all of a sudden, I don't know, I'm having to argue with my pap all of a sudden today, and I'm going to prophesy against him. And next week, pap comes in, well, I'll show my grandson, and I'm going to prophesy against him this week. People have done that in the past, but that's not love. That's not the way the gifts are supposed to be used. And because of that, Paul gives instruction in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that it's not all about love, 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 but when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, we can't, if we're going to be used to any avail, it's got to be when we have love in our heart. Otherwise, we may be using the gift of tongues, we may be using the gift of prophecy,
but it, all it is is a bunch of noise. And there are other gifts that we need to have working in our church, and there may be already, but they're less common. <coughs> I can't tell if somebody's being used in the gift of faith at all times. You don't know that for sure unless they come out as something that's evident. Or the discernment of spirits. May, we may not see that working, but there are gifts that it appears that are evident that are missing from our churches. God's design is for all the gifts of the Spirit to be used in every single church. So he desires for somebody in this church to have the gift of tongues, someone to have the gift of interpretation, prophecy, discernment of spirits, working of miracles, faith, and all the other ones. And maybe one person might have some, maybe one person might have all, and maybe one person might have one. But God desires regardless that every church have all the gifts working in their midst. Because when only one gift is working, or maybe the three prominent ones that we always talk about, tongues, interpretation, it's almost as if you're walking through life with a foot cut off, or a piece missing of your body. Or you realize that even if your little toe is cut off, or your big toe, it can throw off your balance. We need to have all the gifts of the Spirit in operation in our church. And that is the desire of God's heart. The problem is, it comes down to us. Not too many people want to go that far. Because it requires obedience. It requires sacrifice. You realize that if we want to really hear the voice of God, it takes sacrifice and us paying a price on our part. Whether or not, whether it's us, God wanting us to give something up, whether it's us spending a lot more time in prayer, whether it's us spending time in fasting. But the thing is, too, if God's given us a gift, we need to be trying and striving to go deeper in that gift. That we may be used more powerfully, that we may master that gift. It is for us. And how do we do that? Prayer, through sacrifice, through obedience to God, through faithfulness to God. Because if we are not faithful to God, if we are not obedient to God, how can He trust us with anything more? And really, when it comes to the gifts, it's nothing that one should be jealous of. But rather, we should all covet the best gifts. That we may have them working in our own life. Because, like I said, if God can't trust us with them, how should he, why should he give them to us? Because where are the gifts to be used? In church, but also out of church. In our everyday life, everywhere we go. The gifts of the Spirit aren't just for us to be used in church, but they are rather to be a sign to the unbeliever as well. And maybe God wants to let loose a prophecy in the middle of Walmart because you don't know. For all you know, there's a group of ministers down another aisle that you can't even see. But would we be obedient in such a location that God, if you want to use me, use me? We don't know how God's always working. But what we do know is we're living in a day and age where there's a great falling away. And we need to see God move like never before. And if persecution comes upon the church, these four walls might not be here anymore. We might not always be able to meet in a safe location. But rather, just like the Jews back on the day of Pentecost and the days after, the man who was healed at the gate, beautiful, was not healed within the church walls. But rather, even technically, he was healed outside of their church's wall, the temple. He was not healed there in their meeting in the midst in the upper room inside the temple. But rather, all Peter and John were doing was going to pray. Paul, when he cast down the demon on the fortune telling girl, he was going to the river to pray. Because that's where the early church would meet sometimes, is by the river. And he cast her out, cast that demon out along the way. 
The gifts of the Spirit are not for use just within these four walls. It's for everywhere we go. But the question always comes down to is, you and I, are we willing to be obedient wherever we are? Are our spiritual ears always open to listen to the voice of God? Because to be honest, sometimes our spiritual ears are open in church. But then we go to Walmart afterwards or to the grocery store, and all of a sudden our mind is so fixated on getting food in our stomach and everything else, we couldn't hear the Holy Ghost if He wanted to speak to us. Because we've gotten our mind far from Him. We're fixated on carnal things instead of spiritual things. When spiritual things should be the primary focus of our life. Even if they're not in the foreground, there should be enough of our spirit that is so attuned in God that when the Holy Ghost speaks, we hear it and we pick up on it just like that. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add? If not, go ahead and just set your uh, papers on the remembrance of me table as you're leaving or in between services, and I'll get them then. Like I said, if you want to study anything specific in the book of Psalms, any Psalms in general, any words, any topics, anything, that is the paper to fill out. That way I have guidance and an idea on, hey, this is what they want to look at, and we'll start look at it in a little bit more detail and depth. But we'll make sure that we'll cover it. Because the book of Psalms contains 150 chapters and I think over 4,000 verses. So this gives me an idea on how to narrow it down just a little bit farther. But let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we give you praise and glory because you are God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now we rebuke every attack of the enemy of our, that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, making himself visible if he so chooses, Lord. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be good soil for your word to follow, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week, that even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives, be transformed into your very image, even Father, Lord. May we have a desire to know you and the power of your resurrection, Lord, in a mighty and powerful way that our spiritual ears and eyes would be constantly open, Lord. May we desire spiritual things. May we not be content just to come and sit in the pew, Lord, but may we desire to go farther, Lord. And we don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. May we have a desire to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost for ourselves, Lord, for it's a free gift, Lord. I pray, Lord, that if we do not have the use of the Spirit working in our lives, Lord, that we, you would reveal to us what gifts are in our lives, Lord, that you've given us, Lord. And teach us how to use them, Lord, that you may be magnified and glorified, Lord. That we would become mighty Pentecostal powerhouses for your sake, not because of who we are, but because of who you are, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the pastor as he brings forth the word today. Anoint his mind and his lips, Lord, as your word falls, brings, comes forth. Anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. As they lead us in the songs you have to sing, Lord. I pray, Lord, that our minds and our hearts would be fixated on you, Lord. That we, we that you may be at the forefront of our thoughts, Lord. But even greater than that, Lord, that we would have a desire to change, Lord, and that we would have a willingness to change, Lord. It's not always just a desire, Lord. But a, may we have a willingness as well, Lord, that when you say, I want you to change this, that we are willing and obedient, Lord. Even though it may have hurt, Lord, oh, it may be a sacrifice, Lord, may we be willing to change for you because of who you are. Lord, we know that there's coming a day when we shall stand before you, Lord. May we not be ashamed on that day, Lord, when you ask why weren't you using this gift, Lord, that we may say, well, we didn't know we had that gift. May we not be ignorant, Lord, but, Lord, take us deeper in the things of you, that we may know you in a greater and more powerful way than ever before. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said,